Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Okay. Uh, Lord Jesus, we come before you now. We, we pray that you bring changes and a great harvest through each one of us, Lord. We trust your word. Bring out the power, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious, anxious about, about anything, anything, but in everything, everything by, by prayer and, and supplication, supplication with thanksgiving, thanksgiving let, let your requests, requests be made known, known to God. God. And, and the, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. Thank God, Lord, we have this word. We thank you, God, that there's something we can do about the turbulence and the lack of peace that we suffer from in ourselves, in our homes, and in this nation and around the world. God, we trust you. We trust you. We pray you make this alive and actionable in us, this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week, uh, of course, we were talking about the justice and things of that nature and, and all of the, 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 uh, the struggle that's going on in this country. Um, and there are many issues. Uh, there's racial issues, prejudice issues, uh, requirements for justice, law and order. Um, but then we have so many other things that God is holding us accountable for, including the murder of babies, uh, abortion, and uh, fathers who are not fathering, and broken families, and um, uh, crime. Uh, so there are many things, and God's going to hold all of us, every one of us, accountable for those things. Well, as we're watching television and looking at social media, the, the whole world is, uh, I mean, America at least seems to be falling apart. On top of that, we have the pandemic, disease, the potential for great economic hardships, and um, which we haven't felt the full effect of yet. You know, it's, it's coming. So, um, and by the way, <laughs> the way that uh, Jennifer and I protect our finances it's by sowing into the kingdom of God what, what we uh, believe in our heart um, is required. Uh, it's not about just worrying about things. And that's what uh, Philippians 4, 4 to 8 is all about. Uh, don't be anxious. Don't be. I see some, especially some young people, they're just falling apart over this. This is like the first time they've seen these kinds of crises. And, uh, but for those of us who have been around longer, um, I can remember even as a young boy, the, the riots in 1968. I just remember hearing something on the news and places you couldn't go in Philadelphia when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I mean, you talk about a country that was tipped on edge and um, it was uh, severe. Uh, of course, there were before us, there was the polio, uh, uh, time of polio. And I knew people that had, uh, been crippled because of polio. So uh, the, the uh, pandemic occurred before uh, I was aware of it, but I remember the people who still suffered from that disease afterwards. And then of course we moved into the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement, movement and all of those times were, were just horrible. I can remember during Jimmy Carter's presidency when OPEC had a, um, a you know, they were having a stranglehold on us and uh, we couldn't afford gasoline and we had to turn down our thermostats to 65 or whatever it was uh, all day. And uh, you had to wear a, a, a sweater and sweatpants around the house. I can also remember uh, when we were only allowed to buy $5 worth of gas and we all stood in line and you'd have to turn your car off and you just barely had enough gas to go to the store and go to your work. Um, so uh, there have been many times of horrible crises. And even the 1960s with the drug addictions that came out of that, the hippie movement and uh, the free sex movement. Um, and then when abortion was legalized in 1973 and Roe versus Wade, and then uh, you know that first year, there are almost 1.6 million abortions. I mean, I'm looking back on this historically, but um, these things are significant crises. Um, so there's always something. And as Jesus said, you will always have the poor, but you won't always have me. So seek him, seek him first. 
Now, it doesn't mean we should turn a blind eye to social injustice and things of this nature, but when that becomes your religion, your idol, and your passion above Jesus and his kingdom, you're missing the point. And you're ch it's like pushing a noodle uphill. I mean, you're, you're never going to solve every single social injustice issue. You're never going to completely solve poverty. We've been at it for how long? It hasn't happened. I don't believe you're ever going to completely solve racial prejudice. It just, it, 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 nothing has worked. Inequalities of income. You can do some things and it can help, but really, vastly, these things still exist. Disease still exists. Famine still exists. War still exists. And Jesus tells us these things are going to continue on and maybe get, and getting worse until the end of time. So if that's all you're focused on, you're going to be constantly frustrated and disappointed. You'll never see any kind of substantive change that's going to be lasting. And again, like last Sunday, we talked about the change of people's hearts. You know, what did Paul and Jesus do? When they, they encountered a more unjust world than what we encountered, it was horrible. I mean, their worship, their pagan worshipers, the, the, the emperor is um, vastly sexually immoral. He's got slaves. He's using people. He's murdering Christians. Their Christians are being tortured. And uh, there's all kinds of things. There's talk about <laughs> poverty. I mean, these people didn't even have shoes or clothes. They were so poor. There was no social safety net. There was no unemployment. There was no social welfare. All of those things came out of Christianity, by the way. And the freedom of slaves. If you go back to Wilberforce in England and um, uh, the gentleman who wrote Amazing Grace, uh, Newton, uh, um, they, uh, they were uh, the ones who brought about the freedom of slaves and the end of slavery in the English empire, the British uh, nation. So, but um, in America, unfortunately, we continued uh, using people as slaves long after that. And uh, we built our nation on the income from slavery. So that's why there was a war. It was more of an economic issue. Uh, they didn't want to give up the backbone of the, the vibrancy of our economy. And now we're living with that sin today. We enslaved people. Um, but look, I can't, I can't heal all of that. I talked to my African-American friends and I said, you know, they asked me a question about like, what do we do about this injustice? And I said, man, this is deep and wide and there's not, I can't fix this whole thing myself. And you know, what if every, I, I think that the one area that we could really make a, amends is by asking for forgiveness. But these, these things are uh, emotionally painful, they're economically painful, they're uh, politically painful, it goes on and on. So what are we going to do? Well, there were slaves at the time of uh, Paul and, and Jesus as well. And they didn't make that their main social issue even. I think it was Paul, Paul said, you know, if you can get your slavery, if you can be freed from from slavery, go ahead and do it. But in the meantime, obey your master. Isn't that interesting? So the Christian view is not one of protest or violent rebellion. Over and over again, we see that's not what God calls us to do. Instead, he calls us to act in love. And he tells us, as we memorize that verse for this Sunday's Bible study, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the Christian charter. And if you don't do those things, all your protesting and voting and everything else is really not going to move the needle on people's hearts and will not bring the kingdom of God to this earth. So um, not, you know, not to poo-poo uh, social causes, but the way we need to encounter these things is the way that Paul and Jesus did. So priority was, what was it for them? It wasn't protest and rebellion, clearly. In fact, they allowed suffering for themselves and uh, never said to a Christian, you know, you're not going to have suffering. That, that was not what they said. Instead, the message was, wow, you're suffering. Maintain love 
obey law and order, serve others. And what we just uh, recited was pray for those who persecute you. Pray. If people took all of the energy that they spend worrying about things, protesting, complaining, blabbing on social media, whatever it is, listening to the news, those things cause, cause anxiety. They don't cause peace. It causes more dissension, it causes more anger and bitterness. And what we need to do is pray. And you can't leave off your prayer list those who are doing the persecution. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I, when the Lord spoke this to me uh, a couple times when I was being persecuted, uh, really severely, a couple times at work, uh, different people, and but it's really bad. One time was, I, <laughs> I had a senior officer call my office overseas and he said, uh, he talked to a, someone who was a friend of mine. He didn't know he was a friend of mine. And he said, hey, I heard Bill's a Christian. Do you think that's gonna cause problems in his work? Oh, yeah. And one time I, you know, I had a Bible on my desk and I, I was the lead uh, instructor for a course and someone wrote a complaint up to my boss and said, hey, how can the lead instructor keep uh, the Holy Bible on his desk. This is prejudicial. It's, pre you know, um, nevertheless, I kept the Bible there. I didn't take it away. Uh, you're going to be persecuted for your faith, brothers and sisters. But see, if you don't exhibit your faith in any way, you won't be persecuted on those issues. And they won't mean anything to you because you're not taking a stand for Jesus. You're not saying anything for him. You're not praying for people. You're not openly saying, now I'm not saying you, you know, your witness is more about your personal testimony. I, I prayed at work lunches, whether that, you know, I said, hey, I, do you mind if I pray? And I mean, they're shocked, you know, it's not the normal thing. <laughs> and uh, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll just sit there. I could say they're quiet and they're, they're probably thinking all kinds of us. But you know, when the time is right, do it. I've prayed for the sick at work. I've prayed for people to be saved at work. I've cast out demons at pe of people in my office. So, you know, and they all, it always encounters risk. But I want to tell you, before I go to work every day, I do one thing. And even while I'm at work, before I go to meetings, before I write important papers or whatever it is, I pray. But most people, and I'm afraid many Christians, they just react. They just move into one problem after another. They worry about this problem. They talk to their friend about the problem. And they, they, sometimes they gossip about problems and people. And none of that leads to a positive outcome. You know, Paul, there's a good chapter on this in Acts 19. What was Paul doing with all these social injustices, the poverty, massive poverty, the uh, oppression of the Romans over the Jewish people, uh, the division between Jew and Gentile and slave and free. Um, what did Paul do? He didn't make that his preeminent passion. No, he encounters, if we look at the beginning of Acts 19, he encounters uh, 12 guys from Ephesus. And he didn't say, hey, what, hey, guys, come, let's go protest the injustices we see in Ephesus. Let, let's, let's protest paganism and let's protest the emperor and la, 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 la. No, he didn't do that. He, said, he encounters them. He says, hey, are you believers? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we've been baptized. We had John's baptism. And, and then Paul says, well, wait a minute. Have you heard of the Holy Spirit? And they go, no, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. No, we're, but we're going around. We're talking about John's baptism and the need for repentance. And he says, well, wait a minute. How were you baptized? And uh, how could you have been baptized properly if you didn't hear of the Holy Spirit? So, yeah. in other words, when you're baptized, you need to hear the Holy Spirit. Baptized, in Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world, right? Making disciples and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you baptize, you have to hear about the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's saying. 
And so he baptizes them, it says, in the name of Jesus, which is, and as a whole, the name of Jesus. And then they have, they re- he lays his hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. He sends them on their way. He didn't give them a list of rules. He didn't give them a charter to protest certain issues. He didn't say, you're now a member of Paul's, St. Paul's Church. He didn't say any of that. Uh, he, he made sure they, were, they expressed their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in, in Jesus. He, laid his, he baptized them in water. He laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when you receive the Holy Spirit, guess what? He's there to help you do something, and it's not to cause rebellion and conflict. The Holy Spirit is empowering you to bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, into this world through your life. Now, how do you do it when this whole world is nuts and the prince of this age is Satan? He's in charge of your media. He's in charge of governments. He's in charge of all kinds of things on this earth, behind the scenes. He's in charge of protest movements. He's in charge of some police departments. He's, so how, little me, what am I going to do? Well, what did little old Paul do? I mean, so he's looking at people getting saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's what mattered to him. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Again, this is how we begin to move. What is speaking in tongues? It's a prayer language. Praying. Praying in the Spirit. Moving mountains through prayer. And uh, your life will change to an extent as you follow God. You follow the Holy Spirit. Your mind is renewed by the Word. And it'll change to such an extent that the Holy Spirit upon you will begin reaching out from you and living waters will come rushing out of you and people's lives will be touched and changed. Now remember, Paul didn't just preach the gospel. And Paul didn't just teach the word of God. He also moved in the power of the Holy Spirit and he baptized people in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was passionate about this. You can't change an invisible war, which is what we're fighting. It's not just the the protests and the antagonism between races and police and all these other people. It's not that. It's a spiritual war that we are fighting, and we can only win through spiritual weapons. Pray. Pray. And Paul says in in 4.6, do not be anxious about anything. Nothing. Don't be worried about President Trump doing what he's doing. Don't be worried about the police doing what they're doing. Don't worry about the protesters and this and that and the economy and all of these other things. Pray. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Let your request be made known to God, the ultimate judge, the ultimate jury, the ultimate authority, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the justice. He will execute pure justice. Pray. So pray. Don't just protest. Pray. If these people were out on the streets and they were praying and they were tearing down strongholds, and they were loving their enemies, and they were praying for those who persecuted, praying in the face of the policemen, praying in the, uh, at the White House, praying, praying over jails, praying over, praying over all of the, praying over abortion clinics, praying over all the injustices and the murderous things of this world that Satan has institutionalized, even by our laws. Pray, go up to the protest line and pray and hold a Bible, and don't throw a brick, and don't try to spit on a police officer, and certainly don't shoot them. Pray, pray. Officer, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for your protection. I'm going to pray for your peace in your heart. I'm going to pray for your family. Let's pray. Let's pray there's no more injustice. And Paul went around in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. He, go in 
to a church, go in to a Bible study, go into these so-called prayer, whatever has the name of Christ on it, they need to be preached to sometimes too. They need to know the kingdom of God. Your so-called Christian friends that are far off, they also need the kingdom of God. We need to bring the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, through relationship. That's what Paul did. And he failed inside the, the so-called churches, the synagogues. So he went to uh, a place called the Hall of Ty Tyrannus. And there he preached for two years and everybody heard the gospel. Paul's passion and his mission sent by Christ was to preach the gospel so that everyone can hear it. Not everybody receives it, but they all heard it. Two years. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. You will change the world by preaching the gospel, by sharing Jesus. That's what you need to focus on. And pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. But in those circumstances, I don't think I finished that story. When I was being persecuted, God told me to pray for these people. And I remember multiple times, and I still do this when I feel that someone has harmed me, I feel God reminding me, pray for that person. Pray for their salvation. Pray for their, uh, to come out of backsliding. Pray for, uh, uh, Sometimes I pray for the resuscitation of the relationship. Other times, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I pray for them. I pray for ministries and that, that kind of failed or failed me. I pray for them. Um, it sure beats better than bitter uh, bitterness and complaining and attacking people all the time. Um, and that's what you have to do. And there's a, there's a transformation in your heart when you begin praying for your enemies and uh, pray, uh, loving them and praying for them. It forces you to, to encounter your natural flesh reaction and it, and it makes you humble, like, wow, I don't wanna pray for that person, but God says, you pray for them, pray for them. <laughs> and uh, you become more like Jesus in those moments. Um, it's really important. And then it says in verse 11, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Do you see why you can't get a police department to change or a government to change or protesters or a, a, a abortionists or whatever? Because they have evil spirits in them and they've got to come out. And that's part, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God, demonstrating the authority of Jesus Christ, casting out demons so that people can get free and stay free, and that those demons are not influencing their politics and their social positions and, and their prejudice and everything else, and their viciousness and their unforgiveness, demons, demons. That's how... Things were beginning to change. You can never let go of the spiritual warfare that we're encountering, and, neither, and Paul didn't. He did the whole thing. He did the whole nine yards. Now, Billy Graham's preaching saved me, but he did not heal me. I know that when it wasn't until I got baptized in water, and I knew that later that God must have been taking demons out of me. I felt so fresh and clean. Well, you need some help along the way, and those demons are going to try to attack you again. And there's a process of deliverance that we all need to continually encounter. But they, it's not just saying yes to the gospel. It's also the deliverance factor and the power of God. Now, I would technically, I should be dead right now because I have a genetic, or I used to have a genetic problem with my liver. But um, the Lord healed me, as Johns Hopkins proved and couldn't explain. But I, I would have most likely died from that genetic problem. So heal the diseases. See, Satan was cast out of my body. The sickness was cast out of my body. It was genetic. It was something that was in me as a generational curse, something from my family line. Well, God took that away miraculously. Yeah. And that's, you know, I can't preach the gospel if I'm dead. <laughs> heal diseases. Cast out demons. 
demonstrate that there really is another kingdom. And don't just live in this kingdom. Don't just live in the United States of America. Your citizenship is in heaven. And that's a supernatural kingdom. And we have to demonstrate that it's real, not just some myth. <clears throat> Jesus just isn't a good idea. He's not my imaginary friend. You know, th these, he's real. He's alive. He's got power. He has a kingdom. He has authority. And I'm going to demonstrate that to the people that I encounter by my changed life, by my passion for him. And I have to do it through the power of prayer. See, you're losing because you're not praying. And maybe you're praying, but you're not praying seriously. And maybe you're praying about the wrong things. You have to question your walk with the Lord if you're not praying. You can't do this thing. You're fighting invisible spirits and you need prayer. Paul prayed all the time. Jesus got up early in the morning and went off all alone and prayed. And he also prayed together with the disciples uh, during the Last Supper. They all prayed together. So it's not just being alone and in your closet. It's also praying corporately. It's both. You have to do both. And I'm praying silently at work. I'm praying silently when I encounter people that I want to share the gospel with. I'm praying before I. Uh, lay hands on people for their healing or the casting out of spirits. I pray in the morning. I pray in my car. I especially pray in my car after what's happened to us. And uh, we pray for our safety and the safety of those people around us. Satan will get in there. you got to constantly be in prayer. Extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And it was all to prove that he belonged to another kingdom with another authority. And he didn't pray to just cast out social injustices. He was casting out demons and he was healing the sick and stunning miracles were happening. And these are not described, by the way, extraordinary miracles. So it, it's almost intentional. Well, I'm sure it's intentional that the word does not describe every single miracle that Jesus and Paul did but they were extraordinary. And the reason I believe for that is that we don't define those miracles. We don't define whether we're going to see oil dripping from the wall or gold dust or, or people growing out limbs or, or uh, the form of deliverance that's occurring to people. No, that's up to God. All we do is bring the power and the authority of that kingdom into a sick and divided world. Evil spirits came out of them. I bet if I could go and, and if all of us could go and lay hands on those protesters and those police, we would see demons coming out of them if they allowed us to pray for them. Lots of demons, demons of anger, bitterness, prejudice, hatred, corruption, all forms of corruption, murder uh, in various forms. Um, but we, we don't have that opportunity. But when we encounter individuals or in a group uh, that God ordains that opportunity, we can cast them out. I've, I've cast demons out of people on the sidewalk. Um, not everybody likes to see that, but, um, you know, so I've cast demons out of pastors. They're all over the place, baby. And um, we're in a different kind of war. And many of us listening right now need deliverance. Religion and a past profession with faith in Christ does not maintain our deliverance. And it says that in 19, if we go down further, verse 18, 1918, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. Believers need to confess their sins. Amen. And while Paul is moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, people are becoming convicted, even those who are now believers, and they're confessing. See, if we have a ministry and there's no confession of sins, we have a big problem. Because now we have a lot of religious-based Christians, and none of them are getting free, and none of them are confessing their sins, and they're living a lie. I mean, there have been times where I had issues going on in myself, and I, I just couldn't acknowledge them or deal with them. And, and yet I'm going on and I'm, I'm doing all the Christian things, all the other Christian things, but I'm not dealing with the issue that God's telling me I need to deal with. It's like this blindness, this callousness that forms over a part of our ability to see within ourselves. 
And, uh, but really, you need to confess and you need to repent. And, and only then, you have to take your sin very seriously. And it says, divulging their practices. Are you going to admit, like uh, our sister talked earlier, she said, I'm not proud of this, but, and that's true. I, there are so many things that I wasn't proud of, but I had to, you know, eventually this comes to the surface and you have to confess it and, and divulge it. And you need the help of the Holy Spirit to do that. It's not just talking about the Word of God only. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Hey, I was, I was following another religion. I was, I was doing horoscopes. I was reading palms. I was uh, actually casting spells on people. Boy, that's a big bondage, and you have to burn that. Um, and you have to in front of people. It has to be public because Satan will really grab hold of you on that one. And then it says, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. All these things are necessary for the word of the Lord to prevail and for the kingdom of heaven to grow and increase. Power of God, word of God, uh, baptism, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit, confession of faith, uh, healing of the sick, casting out demons, and um, uh, 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 <laughs> um, all those other things I just said. Um, oh, burning, uh, you know, getting rid of idols and icons and destroying false images and, uh, and getting rid of occult practices and belief in luck. Any form of luck or superstition has to be de destroyed. Um, and then, uh, of course, we need de deliverance, confession, and repentance. Now, as Paul's doing this, guess what happens? It's not a peaceful time. A riot at Ephesus occurs. Now, what do we see going on in America? We see riots occurring. But it's not because of the struggle of the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan, per se. The battle is not between Christians stirring up these other things. It's not Christians going out, casting out demons and preaching the gospel, and then we have a riot. No, we've got Christians or so-called Christians or pseudo-Christians and non-Christians together protesting and violating uh, uh, in a lawlessness in some cases. Their, their focus is causing riots, but it's not, it's not based on the kingdom of God. It's based on social and political issues. It's the wrong kind of riot. But when Paul did what he did, the way God told him to do it, it says in uh, Acts 19.23, about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, the way is Christianity, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. Wealth from pagan things. There are, there are churches and ministries getting wealthy as well. They're making idols. Artemis was making statues. Do I need to tell you religions that bow down and worship and sell statues and crucifixes? There's a wealth in that too. A great obscenity in the amount of money being made by certain ministries and world churches and uh, and then there's also those profiting from this, uh, these so-called movements. The news, the media makes money by stirring up dissension and anger between groups. So you watch their TV shows and, uh, and then uh, they have advertising revenue that comes in. They propagate lies. They focus on hatred and division and instead of healing and truth because they're making money from it. And I wouldn't doubt that um, people in political parties are also profiting on campaign donations by exploiting 
these divisions. Um, you can use your own imagination for how that's working out. And uh, that's, a, that's a great harm to this nation. They make money. And, and you know, as Christians, we don't believe in idols. We don't believe in getting wealth from what we're preaching. Freely you have received, freely give. And uh, we're not supposed to make money on our Christian music or on our ministry or selling books and tapes. We're not supposed to. This is supposed to be as free as we can make it, which is what I'm trying to do. Free. Somebody asked me one time, they said, why do you post your Bible studies online? Like, you know, for anybody to use. They didn't, they didn't understand why we did that. Uh, to help people. <laughs> um, it didn't cost us anything but time and the leading of the Holy Ghost to produce them. Uh, should I charge them? I keep it a secret? Am I supposed to keep the Word of God a secret? And then I've seen other pastors get upset that if you borrow something from their preaching that, hey, that was mine. Well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> if God gave it to you and the Holy Spirit gave it to you and it's from the Word of God, well, then that should be shared. It's not yours. If it's yours, I don't want it. Poof. I want God's stuff. And that should be free because God doesn't charge me for his word. God doesn't charge me for his Holy Spirit. And when Simon the magician tried to pay for the Holy Spirit, Peter said, you better repent, boy, because, you know, God's, God could really take your life on this one. You're going to be a big trouble. Hopefully he'll forgive you. Don't get money mixed up into these things. And all of your social causes, when you're buying T-shirts and that sort of thing, be careful here. I, I started to give money to one cause that was uh, about an issue that I, I, I didn't agree with. And yeah, I got the t-shirt. So. Um, but then I found out they're, they're using their money for another political agenda. It wasn't just the issue that I was concerned about. So they're sending money to political candidates that believed in abortion and all these other things. And I stopped giving them money. That wasn't the point of my, you know, so they're tricky. They're very tricky. Be careful. Be careful. Uh, in any event, so we have this riot breaking out now, and uh, it says in verse 28, when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. And... Uh, and then it goes to 32. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come, come together. You know, when people start protesting, I'd like to ask the question, what is it you attempt to achieve? So you say social justice. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> Practically, tell me what it is you're protesting about and that you expect to be done. And I bet if you ask most people, they have no idea. They're just expressing rage and out, you know, uh, I don't like this, I don't like the police. Well, let's, how do we fix this? It's not just about complaining, it's about a solution. And only God's gonna give us that solution. And we need to do something to find out what God's thinking and what his solution is. What do you think that is? Pray. <laughs> That's how you ask God, God, what should I be doing? God, how can this situation change? God, how can your kingdom come? Then pray, and when you pray, don't give him the solution. If you really want to know what he's thinking, ask and listen and wait, and wait until he gives you revelation. It may come through the word, it may come from prophecy, it may come from interpretation of tongues or some other way, but wait until you know God's speaking. That's what we need to do, pray and listen. Otherwise, you have chaos, people running around. What are you arguing about? What are you mad about? Why did you do that? I don't know. They're all doing it. <laughs> uh, don't just follow the crowd. You're like lemmings. Uh, and this happens politically. The political spirit gets a hold of Republicans. It gets a hold of Democrats. And they just run like lemmings. Oh, well, this guy said it on his TV show. And this one said that. So, yeah, let's. And now, you know, but, but they're not, they're not allowed. They're not able to use 
discernment where the sword of the spirit causes, uh, you know, spirit and soul to be divided and discernment on what these people are talking about. And uh, don't just look at the overall message, but let's get down into the nitty gritty and find out what truth really is or else you just have chaos. Now, it's interesting that the pagan governor of this area responds to this chaos in verse 38. He says, if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. Due process. Follow the legal system. And there are proconsuls. There are judges. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. A pagan governor during the Roman times says, follow the legal system or else we will be charged with rioting, <laughs> in danger of rioting. He had sense to follow the law, but not in this country. And now you've got a wave of lawlessness that is bringing complete disrespect to law and order and the police. This boggles my mind. We're talking 2,000 years later, and this unsaved pagan had more godly justice in him and more sense and reason than what we see on the streets of America. That ought to be frightening. It scares me. It scares me over the direction of this nation. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is where we need to be. Don't worry about all the rioting. Don't worry about the confusion brought on by American um, media and by the political parties and by the protesters and by the police unions, which by the way, is another issue, protecting cops from facing their own justice. I don't want to start another argument. <laughs> now let me just end this with, um, with a little story here. It's about King Hezekiah in two kings, and it goes on between 18 and 19. And King Hezekiah was faced with an invasion by the Assyrians. And uh, uh, the man uh, leading the charge, the king again, uh, attacking the, the Jews was uh, Sennacherib. And um, he was ruthless and he had victory after victory against uh, many nations including the Israelites. If you'll remember that the God's people had been divided into the kingdom of um, Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Well, the Israelites had been demolished by this guy, and now Sennacherib was standing at the gates of Jerusalem and threatening all of Judea. And uh, there was a man, the king who was in charge of Judah was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was going to deal with this crisis in a particular way. He didn't try to raise an army to fight an army that was stronger than his. There was no way to fight them. In fact, the Syrians mocked them. And they said, look, we'll make a deal with you. We'll even give you 2,000 horses uh, if you can find 2,000 soldiers to go on top of them. And the implication was, you got nothing. And we're not afraid of you. And we know we can destroy you easily. In fact, there were 185,000 Assyrians perched on the doorstep of Jerusalem. There's no way they could fight these guys. The, the problem was bigger than their resources or their capacity. But Hezekiah was a good king. And uh, he, uh, he did something. He, he, he took the threatening uh, message that came from the Assyrians and uh, he, uh, he read it. And it says in uh, 2 Kings 19, uh, 15, or let's start at 14. 
Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Now, after he prayed this, the Assyrians turned on one another. God caused them to attack one another, all 185,000. So there was chaos among themselves. And his soldiers never had to fight. And Senatera uh, and his, his forces retreated and left. And there's actually extra biblical record that demonstrates this, which I'm not going to get into, but it, it showed that uh, he did not conquer Jerusalem, even though he wanted to. So we know this was a, and there is also a biblical, uh, extra biblical record of Hezekiah being the king at this time. There's a lot of evidence supporting all of this happened just as, as it says. Now, I just wanted to draw your attention to a few things about this victory that was brought through Hezekiah's prayers. And number one, Hezekiah acknowledged God as king of all the earth and creator of all. So what's this teaching us? How do you approach God? Did you notice one thing about his prayer? It was very simple, right? That was it. He just said, God, you are king, creator of all. He ends it in verse 19. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. That really is the crux of his prayer. And he says it within five sentences, four or five sentences, very quickly. Now, he's just prayed for, this, for the salvation of Jerusalem and all the Jewish people. Now, how would you pray? Would you pray four or five clear sentences, or would you ramble on with a bunch of words and trying to be as flowery as possible? Well, whenever Jesus prayed, it was always short and sweet, and it always, boom, right there. And that's the way Paul prayed, boom. And that's the way Hezekiah prayed. Don't fluff around. You don't need it. Are you trying to impress God with how you pray? With the flowery language? Or how, whether you're standing or sitting? or You know, I mean, it is good. There, there's example of prayer in all positions, supplication all the way down to the ground, head down to the ground. There are people on their knees praying. There's people sitting praying. There are people raising their hands. There are people standing. There are people dancing. There are, there's singing prayers. There are all kinds of prayers. But what you do not rely on is your sophistication and the, and the specific, you know, you got to get all the right words and it's got to sound good. Man, you can be bumbling and stumbling. But if your heart is fixed on God, if you pray in faith and your words are saying what they need to say, look, Jesus says God already knows what you're going to pray before you say it. Why do you want to confuse him with a long prayer? He doesn't need your help. You're praying to bring his power down because you're in union with God and you demonstrate that you understand his will and his word when you pray, and then you unite together, and the power of God comes and does what it needs to do. It's not you and your sweet talk. You're not going to sweet talk God. He knows the heart, and he knows what he wants to do. He wants you to just say it simply, in faith, according to his will, and now you're going to start to see a change happen. But Hezekiah did have a little format. He acknowledged that God is king of all the earth and creator of all. He then, step two, he asked God to listen and see. He said, step three, 
he prayed that God himself would not be mocked by the enemy. This was not a prayer merely of self-preservation. He wasn't just saying, God, please help me as king. I don't want to die. I don't want him to cut my head off and poke my eyes out or whatever. I don't want my head on a stake in front of the gate. That's the way they would treat defeated kings, right? Uh, and, and I'm not just praying for the people. I'm not just praying, God, it won't, the people are going to suffer economically. They're going to be, the women are going to be raped. The children are going to be torn, whatever. He's not saying that. He said, God, this is about you. This, we are your people. And if the enemy is allowed to destroy us, how's that going to make you look? He's more concerned with God in his prayer. Even though this is a great threat, this is a terrible time for the Jewish people, they could be starved to death. That's what the, one of the threats was, that they'd be eating their own dung and urine. Um, that's the, so, but, so hardship could come on the Jewish people. He didn't talk about those things. He didn't say, God, please prevent us from being starved and, and embarrassed by these people and tortured by, no. He said, God, if this happens, your name, your name will be sullied. See, he's shifting. The prayer is about God. Now, be people benefit when we pray the will of God and we pray for God and we, we pray that the outcomes of God are, are occurring and that God will not be mocked. We benefit. He's going to protect us. But that's not the nature at the root of the prayer. It's, it's not a selfish prayer. It's a God-based prayer, not a human-based prayer. And then in uh, step four, it says, he acknowledged that, all other religions and spiritual sources are worthless. He said all those other fake gods were burned in the fire. Only faith in Jesus, in, in God our Father, is the power. It's not your politician. It's not your political party. And, and don't be mixing things. You're partly Buddhist. You're partly a good luck person. You got your rabbit foot in the pocket. You got your Mary, your, your, your uh, rosaries and your statue of Mary in the backyard. Or some people even, uh, um, uh, I, I'll, there's another aspect of this, but what, there's, if you go into 2 Kings 18, 2 Kings 18, and, and you go down to verse uh, 4, he says, uh, And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. So this is uh, Hezekiah. He had cleaned up all of these weird practices. So the snake in the desert that, that Moses said is, if you look on that thing, you'll be healed. You know, those serpents that are biting you will not not affect you. Well, they ended up worshiping the religious object that God had used to actually heal people. And it became an idol to them. And uh, Hezekiah destroyed that thing. He destroyed that thing that God told Moses to make because people had corrupted it. It became a good luck charm. And this is what's happening in the Catholic Church when they have statues of Mary and little rosaries and, they, and the crucifix and all these other, any kind of religious icons, they are not godly, even if they're images of God or representations from the Word of God. They are not godly. And you can't put your faith in a religious icon or even just a, a whole, owning a Bible. <laughs> That's not owning. I, I remember talking to one guy who was having multiple affairs, and um, he's a former NFL football player, and he impregnated this young girl in the country I was in. And uh, I said, dude, do you own a Bible? He goes, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got many. I've got this Bible, that Bible. I said, do you ever read one of them? <laughs> yeah. No, but I've got them all on my shelf. They look really nice up there. Um, okay, so, so anyway, don't let your religious icons or the size of your church or the gowns or the, or the, 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 the blue, beautiful flowery language that comes out of the pastor's mouth or your Christian TV shows, don't let those things replace a real walk with the Lord. They're not going to bring about the change. Okay, so now Hezekiah is not straddling between two things. It's only God. It is only God. And when he prays, that's how he's praying. Uh, he's praying, trusting in him. And he has no other idols. He has no other religious or even Christian idols in, 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 his, in his way. And then he says it simply. He asks for God to save the land for his glory, not for Hezekiah's benefit or the sole benefit of the people of the kingdom of Judah. That's how you need to pray. God's will, God's perspective, for God's kingdom to come, not just your selfishness, not only selfishness, 
you will benefit by seeking first the kingdom of heaven, and then all good things will come to you. Pray that way. See, you're not even praying. You don't get this process yet. And I, the Lord's telling me over the next couple, at least the next week, we're going to keep talking about prayer. And I hope some of you feel like, oh, gosh, I want to talk about something else. No, you, gotta, you have no power to change society. You have no power to, to heal people or to bring real freedom. Remember, the results of racial prejudice and the problems we have in division in this country today are the basis of slavery. I want to tell you something about slavery. We all are slaves. When we allow Satan to rule over us, when we're enslaved to sin, and Jesus comes to set us free from that slavery, not just the slavery of the white man or the American white man or the Confederate States or whatever. No, that's a different kind of slavery. It's wrong. But the slavery I'm talking about is a spiritual slavery to Satan in certain areas of your life. And this is what we're here for, brothers and sisters. It's not social causes per se, but the underlying roots of spiritual slavery. Let's set each other free in the power of prayer. Your prayer needs to be focused against sin, against the bondage of sin, against demonic forces. Hezekiah prayed and had results in a short prayer, but he also lived a godly life. And that's, brothers and sisters, you have to do it. You have to lay down your lives to Jesus. Hezekiah, in, in that chapter 2, 18, uh, 2 Kings 18, uh, verse 3, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He obeyed God. And number two, he removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. Get rid of all your false religion. Get, re get rid of your comic books. Get rid of your, your political heroes. Get rid of all of this trash that you're, you think there's some kind of spiritual power to. You call it entertainment? God's calling it an idol. Get rid of your political signs and your, and your racist uh, thinking um, and your, all of those things and your, your TV shows and your news medias that are biased in, in every way. And then number three, he broke the, that serpent that Moses had made. Number four, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Ju Judah. Trust God. And it says, nor among those who were before him. Number five, verse six, for he held fast to the Lord. He didn't give up. He didn't let go. I see Christians so often, either because of their sin or their distraction with the world or their desire for a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, you know, or money or whatever. Now they're not holding fast to God. They're holding fast to the money, to the sex, to pornography, to uh, their own uh, their own ministry, their own religious superiority, whatever it is. But you must hold fast to the Lord. And when you've made these mistakes I just mentioned, don't let go of Jesus. Just ask him to lead you into repentance. And then number six, he did not depart from following him. Number seven, keep he kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. Keep the laws of God. Don't worry about these other crazy laws that violate God's rule. Just because Roe versus Wade says it's legal to have abortion doesn't mean you can have it. You have a different king. You're under a different legal system. You must obey God. And then if you go down to verse 12, excuse me, 11 and 12, the king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria. Now remember, the Israelites were defeated by this same king, but he did not defeat Hezekiah. He did not defeat Judah or Jerusalem because God answered those prayers. But when that same king with the same army came up against Israel, it says, the king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Halah, Halah and on the and on the Haber, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of Medes. He took the people away and, and brought them into their kingdom. That's what Satan will do. Um, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. Even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, they neither listened nor obeyed. Brothers and sisters, obey God. And then when you come before him and you lay the problem out for him, yours or our nations or whatever it is, you lay it out and then you have a simple prayer of faith. Your life is in order. You've obeyed God. You've held on to him. Your prayer is about him and his kingdom. And now 
That's all you have to do. But if you don't, if you disobey God, you're still going to be trying to pray to him. But guess what? The Assyrians will take you away. You'll become captive. And then you'll have anxiety and worry. And then you think you're praying, but you're not praying or living the right way to get the answers to those prayers. And then you continue to encounter defeat by the hand of the enemy. You must have your life in order according to the. So you need to know the word of God. How else can you know the law of God? And then you need to pray according to that word. You need to pray in a faith. And you need to do consistently by holding on to God. You can't jump in and jump out. Oh, today I feel like going to a picnic or a basketball game or a baseball game. Maybe next week I'll go to church. No. Consistent prayer. Consistent connection to Jesus. Learning the word. Living the word. And then prayer becomes easy. And you will have victory as you lay these things down before the Lord. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. And next week, we're going to talk about, uh, I'll probably, it might be eight things. We'll see. There are eight requirements that God has in his word about answering prayer. And we're going to go through those next week because you need results. It's not just talking. It's not just protesting. We want spiritual victories, spiritual results. We want changes in our hearts, in our families, in our nation. Lord Jesus, thank you, God. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you teach us how to pray. You teach us how to pray and that our life is a prayer and that all the groundwork, all of those things that we need to prepare before we become before you in prayer, we've already done, that we do on a regular basis, that we don't just show up with lots of anxiety and repeating prayers that are not answered because we've chosen not to obey you. God, help us get ready for the prayer room, that we take it seriously, that we make an appointment with you, and that we are in a state of confession and repentance, that we're continuing to absorb your word so that we know how to obey you, that our kingdom that we're most concerned about is yours, your will your ways, your plan. And that's how, Lord, we want to learn to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, that's what we want our prayers to begin with. Your will your kingdom, and Lord, I know you're going to change our hearts about how we pray. I trust you, God, that these people today will take up the only weapon that will really work against the advances of our enemy, and that is prayer and holy living, obedience to you. Through these things and the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel, we know you will change things. And the riots will shift from secular arguments to a spiritual warfare. And we will be ready for that, God. We're not afraid of riots that will occur because we stand for you, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, by the word of God. Lord, we know the enemy will come against us, but we also know there will be victory in your name, and we are not afraid. We will not fight our battles with a sword, a, a real metal sword or a weapon, we will fight our battles with the word of God and the Holy Spirit through prayer. And God, I pray that you supercharge our people. And even in this little church, God, that people begin praying, praying and reading the word and that we have changes occurring, that something is really changing in our nation. Something's really changing in our own hearts and in our families. Prayer, prayer, the power, the power, the power of kingdom of heaven coming through prayer, prayer, prayer in the spirit, prayer through the word of God, prayer, prayer, prayer. God, we need to pray to you. We need to learn to pray to you. We trust you, God, clinging to you. God, give us conviction and confession. And Lord, we pray for holy hearts, clean hands and a pure heart and a mind that's been transformed by, the, by your word, God. Lord, we will be weapons in your hands. We will bring your kingdom to this earth. 
bring conviction on those who are not praying. All of us together, we have, everyone has to be rowing this boat. You can't just have two oars in the water and three out. Lord, we want all oars. We pray, God, for your, for your victory, for your glory, that the enemy will not mock you. They will not mock you because this church is in praying. And our enemies, those in our own households that mock us because of our faith, they will have nothing. They will have no victory against you because we are setting the example. We are showing our obedience to you. We are praying. We are living a holy life. What can they say? How can they defeat us when our God is great and we obey him? They will change when we don't. When we are firm and we stand on the rock and our prayers protect us, our prayers give us peace, our prayers take away our anxiety, and the news will not disturb us, and politics won't disturb us, and social injustice will not ruin our sleep and cause us uh, to, to worry, and the economy won't cause us to worry. No, God, we will stand in fastly with you, praying, praying, praying without ceasing. Pray you bring conviction to each person listening for their need to pray and obey. In Jesus' name I pray. And Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to convict people now.